Dr. Michael Heiser shares publicly about a group of extraterrestrial beings referred to in the Bible as the Divine Council of the Elohim. Who is the Divine Council, and why doesn't the Church acknowledge their existence? It seems that someone really doesn't want this information getting out. Psalm 80, 82, verse 1. Uh, mm -hmm. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Whenever we read that, who are these gods? What did they do? Because I've heard many different things, and, and you know, that's why I wanted to get you on the show. Are these the principalities that we're reading about that are over certain areas who sinned? Or, you know, who are these gods that he's speaking of here? Yeah, I, I, think, the, I think we get a clue in the last verse of this psalm where the psalmist says, rise up, O Elohim, rise up, O God, and, you know, judge the earth you know, for you, you know, this is your inheritance. I mean, you're, going, you, you're inheriting over all the nations. The nations are your possession. And I, that language about, again, this inheritance of the nations and all that sort of thing gives us a clue as to what is going on. Okay. Because That's good. that language draws on Deuteronomy 32, uh, 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9. And if, if, you're, if your audience, people in your audience have never seen this verse, this is one of the key verses for understanding really the, the whole worldview of the Old Testament. And I would say also a lot of what's going on in the New Testament, too. And verse 8 in Deuteronomy 32 says, I'm reading from the ESV in case anybody wants to know. When the Most High, we know who that is, gave to the nations their inheritance when he divided humankind. Now, you know, when, when did that happen? When did God divide up the nations? Well, that was the Tower of Babel. And we know the story. When he did that, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Now, a lot of English translations here will read according to the number of the sons of Israel. So there's a very clear difference here. Now, the ESV is one of the few translations. The new RSV is another one. Uh, the NLT, I think the latest version, uh, it has this as well. The ESV reading comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls here read... The B'nai Ha Elohim, the sons of God. Uh, so it is the most textually up-to-date reading. Now you don't have to be a text critic, though, to know that this is the, the correct reading. If you just think about what the verse says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, He divides up human humankind. He fixes the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Why isn't it the sons of Israel? Because Israel didn't exist as a nation back at the Tower of Babel event. There was no Israel. Okay. So, again, I, I don't want to really drift... I, we can go into all the text critical reasons why, you know, in terms of manuscript studies, why Sons of God is the best reading. But I think if you just use common sense here, a biblical sense, it can't be Sons of Israel because Israel didn't exist. If you go back to the Table of Nations, yeah. Genesis 10... You know, which leads up to the Tower of Babel event when the nations are listed. Israel does not occur in the Table of Nations. Why? Because it doesn't exist yet. What 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 this is describing is the Tower of Babel event when when you know God has given this commission. Here we are. We came out of the flood. God says, "Be fruitful and multiply, spread over the earth, and all this stuff." And so, what do they do? Well, let's let's go build a tower. You know, that'll be some gathering point and give ourselves a great reputation. And they, they don't do what they're supposed to do. And so God says, okay, you know, if, if we let this go, again, speaking in the plural, you know, to, to the council again in Genesis 11, mm -hmm. let, let, let us go down and take a look. But then when you actually see who goes down, it's, it's Yahweh, it's the God of Israel, the singular entity. Uh, looking at this, it's like, okay, they're not going to obey. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to split them up. We're going to confuse the languages, divide up the nations. Now, I refer to this as the Romans 1 event of the Old Testament, where God says, look, you don't want to obey me. You don't want me to be your God. Fine. I'm going to scatter you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign each nation to another divine being, to one of the sons of God. And mm -hmm. if you go to Deuteronomy 4, 
Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20 is the parallel passage to this. If you look at the language there, it's actually sort of the flip side of the coin. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 says, Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven when you see the sun, moon, and stars, all the host of heaven, and you be drawn away and bow down to them. He's telling, you know, Moses, and, and through Moses, all of Israel, don't, you know, don't, don't do this. You know, don't get distracted and bow down to the sun, moon, and stars because, verse 19, these are the things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt. So it's the same language as Deuteronomy 32. You go back to Deuteronomy 32, 8. God divided the nations in verse 8. In verse 9, he says, Yeah, I just split everybody up according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion, my portion, is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So this episode, Again, what we think of as the Tower of Babel, this episode is a watershed event in Old Testament and in biblical theology where God disinherits mm -hmm. the nations, the peoples of the earth, and says, okay, you don't want me to be your God, I'm going to put you under lesser authorities, I'm not going to relate to you personally. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to Ur, and I'm going to call this guy called Abraham, or Abram, and I'm going to start over. I'm going to start with one guy, and I'm going to raise up for myself a new people. And to, and to make it even more spectacular, this guy is old, and so is his wife. So I'm going to do something supernatural, something spectacular. I'm going to literally start with nothing, and I'm going to make my own people. And the rest of the Old Testament is the story of that people, Israel, against mm -hmm. the other nations, is and Israel's mm -hmm. God, Yahweh, against the other gods. What happens and what he's referring to in Psalm 82, when, when God appoints the other nations to the sons of God and he appoints the sons of God to the other nations, again, both sides of the same coin, he is still the creator. He is still the, 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 the lawgiver. He is still the Lord of, of justice. He expects that his underling, even though they're divine beings, even though they're Elohim, they're lesser Elohim, he expects them to rule righteously according to the way their creator okay. rules because they share his image. Let us create humankind in our image. They're supposed okay. to do what he says in their realm of authority. And from Psalm 82, it's very plain that they become corrupt. They do something, they mismanage, they abuse the situation. You know, personally, I think in... Elsewhere in the Old Testament, we have an indication that one of the things that, that was offensive was the idea that they would uh, accept worship you know, from these other peoples as in the place of Yahweh. I mean, all these different things. And, and Israel was supposed to be you know, the kingdom of priests idea, that sort of the conduit, the, you know, the, 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 the light out there in the wilderness that would alert people, would, 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 would be some sort of teaching mechanism as mm -hmm. to who the true God was, and then, you know, a path back to him through the nation of Israel, ultimately, of course, through the Messiah. But all of this just gets, just gets messed up, and the nations that were given over to lesser administrators get farther away from God as time goes on, both because of their own, you know, feudal minds, as Paul says, and also because, again, they're... they're manipulated by other divine beings. So take all that and the answer to your question is I, I do think that what we have in the New Testament language, you know, think about some of the terms you use principalities and powers you also have dominions, you have thrones you have rulers, you have authorities uh, The other another term is stoicheia, the, the elemental principles, the elements it's, it, you know, it's that, that one's a little more abstract but these terms are rulership terms. They are authority terms. They, they refer in some way to, to some sort of dominion over like some... Like a government? Like, like a, yeah, like a governing bureaucracy structure or something or other. You know, the, it, it's kind of a mystery in, in terms of New Testament theology, whether you can sort of create a coherent hierarchy out of the New Testament terms. There's actually a lot of debate on that. It, Personally, I don't, I don't think you can clearly do that. I think you can get some that are more 
you know, above others, but I don't, I don't think you can get a whole hierarchy out of it. But I think Paul's mm-hmm. point in using language like that is, is to, you know, stick a bug in our ear for this whole sort of setup in the Old Testament where the nations, those who are not believers, those who are not Yahweh's people, are under the dominion of something else. 